there are many ways in which you can make the last few elements of a looping animation like this fade away. In today's video, we'll be creating this tunnel and exploring another method of fading away the last few elements within a scene like this. It's going to be really simple and I'll go step by step for absolute beginners. With that, let's actually begin the tutorial. In our default scene, we're going to use the default cube itself. So we'll press tab to go into edit mode or use this drop down over here. Then we'll go to face select mode by selecting this button over here and we'll just select this further most edge over there. Now to get a nice view, we'll press 7 on our numpad to go into the top view and we'll zoom in and we'll scale this up on the x axis by pressing S followed by X followed by 1.6. Now the reason why we're scaling it up by 1.6 is because we eventually wanted to scale down to exactly this original size again, which means we're gonna have to scale it by the reciprocal of 1.6. And almost all other numbers give recurring decimal values. So I think scaling it up by 1.6 is the best that we can go for because then we can press E to extrude and just extrude it by two units because the original length of the box was two units, which is the length from here to here. So we moved this face by by two units as well. Now we need it to go back to exactly this distance. So we'll press S X followed by 0 0.625, which is the reciprocal of 1.6. So now we should have a nice symmetrical shape just like this. And we can go ahead and select this face as well by shift and selecting so that both the faces are selected. And then we'll tap X and delete the faces. Now we'll press tab to go into object mode and we'll add in an array modifier. So we'll go to our modifier properties, choose add modifier and choose array. Now I want this to go on the y axis so that it increases like that. So let's change this relative offset factor from an x value of 1 to an x value of 0 and a y value of 1. Then you can go ahead and increase the count to as many as you need. And because this is very low poly, we can easily go to a high count without Blender starting to lag or anything like that. For now, maybe I'll go with a value of 15 and I might increase it or decrease it later on. Once we've created these counts, we can go ahead and press tab to go into edit mode and any change that we make to this first box will occur on all of these as well. So what we'll do is we'll go to edge select mode and just select this edge ring. And to do that, you can press shift plus alt and then select so that the entire ring gets selected. And then I'll just press shift D to duplicate them. And I'll press S and I'll just scale it down by the tiniest amount. Maybe I'll go with a value of 0 0.96. Once I've scaled it down, I want another version of this to be present around this inner ring as well. So if we look at it from the top view, I have one duplicated ring over here, but I want one more duplicated ring over here as well. But if I duplicated this one directly, it would be much larger, but I want it to be the same size as this one. So instead of duplicating that, I can just press shift D on this one itself and then move it on the Y axis till it goes to that position. Now I know that that position is two units away. So I'll just type in the number two and it'll move to the exact correct position. Now I want to add in a geometry node modifier to just these rings and not the rest of the object. So I'll shift alt and select this ring as well and press P and choose separate by selection. So that way this becomes its own object, which we can go ahead and rename to inner loop. The outer cube we can rename to walls. Once you have that done, you can press tab to go back into object mode and then just select the inner loops. For the inner loops, we'll go ahead and choose add modifier and select the geometry nodes modifier over here. Then we'll bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to create a new window and then change this from the 3D viewport to the geometry node editor. Then we'll press this plus button to add in a new geometry node tree. We'll zoom in and we're going to change this group input from a mesh to a curve by pressing shift A and searching for the mesh to curve. Then we're going to convert this back into a mesh by pressing shift A and searching for a curve to mesh node. That way the geometry will become a curve and it'll convert back to a mesh. But for it to be a mesh, you need a profile curve. And for that, we're going to search for a quadrilateral and we're simply going to plug this quadrilateral into the profile curve. Now, of course, the quadrilateral width and height is way too large. So I'll reduce these down to maybe 0.01 and that will make it a really small ring like structure around this ring. However, I think 0.01 is a bit too small. So let's increase that to 0.03. The next thing is that it's shaded smooth. So you have this really weird shading around these regions. I don't want that. So I'll press shift A and search for a set shade smooth node. I'll plug it in over here, but I'll uncheck the shade smooth so that it becomes shaded flat. And then to make this not be this sharp, you can go ahead and add in a bevel modifier by choosing add modifier and selecting bevel. Now we'll go down, we'll increase the segments to something like two or three, and we'll reduce the amount from one to a value of maybe 0 0.01 or 0 0.005. Once that's done, you have to set the material for this as well in the node tree. So let's select the geometry node modifier 
modifier once again, press shift A and search for set material and plug that in right here. And you have to select a material. So let's go to the material properties, add in a new material slot by removing this material and then pressing this new button. Now this material will name as inner loop and we'll select that over here. Once you have that done, you can start off with the shading for all of the elements. So we'll go to our viewport shading of render and we'll select the default light and press delete to remove it. Then we'll go ahead and right click on the junction of these two windows, choose join areas and then just drag it down so that we have only our 3D viewport. Then we'll bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows and click and drag left so that we get a viewport over here and we'll change that from the 3D viewport to the shader editor. Then let's press N to remove the side panel and then we'll just select inner loops. Once you have the inner loop selected, since we already added in the material, it will appear here. If you can't find the nodes, tap A to select everything and period on your numpads to centralize the nodes. Now I want these to be emissive, so I'll select the principled PSDF and tap X to delete it. Then I'll press shift A and search for an emission node and I'll plug that into the surface. Then I'll change the color to a slightly bluish tint just like that and I'll increase the strength from 1 to something like 5. Now this doesn't currently look good, so to make it look good, we're going to go to our render properties, switch on bloom as well as screen space reflections. For the bloom, I'll expand it and decrease the intensity from 0.05 to 0.02. Then I'll go to the world properties and change the background all the way to black, after which I'll select the walls object and mess around with the walls material. So the walls was initially the default cube, so it has the default material attached to it. We can rename this material as well to walls and maybe I want two separate materials where one will be for the actual side walls and the others will be for the ceiling and the floor. So I'll press this plus button to add in a new material slot. Then I'll press this plus button to add in a new material and I'll rename this to floor and ceiling. And then I'll just zoom out and press tab to go into my edit mode and I'll go to face select mode and just select the ceiling faces as well as the floor faces and I'll choose floor ceiling material and hit assign. Then I'll press tab to go into my object mode once again and now with the floor ceiling material selected I'll go ahead and make them completely metallic with a roughness value of something like 0.3 and maybe I'll change the base color from this white all the way to a black. Then I'll choose the walls material and play around with the walls. So for the walls I'll press shift A and search for a wave texture and to preview it if you have node wrangler enabled you can press ctrl shift click to actually see what it looks like. To enable node wrangler you'll have to go to edit preferences add-ons and then search for node wrangler. Make sure that node wrangler is checked and and then you can go ahead and come down here and choose save preferences. Then you can close this out and all of these shortcuts should work after that. We want to add in the mapping and texture coordinate nodes. So we'll press Control T with this wave texture selected to get the texture coordinate and mapping nodes and we'll switch from generated all the way to UV. After that, for the wave texture itself, we'll change the type from sine wave to a saw wave and we'll change the scale from five to something like 20 so that we get many more of these waves. Now I'm going to use this for both the roughness as well as the base color. So let's simply plug this into the base color and also plug it into the roughness. Then to actually preview the principled PSDF, I'll select the principled PSDF and press Control, Shift and then click. Now, although this looks good, I think it'll look even better if I change the metallic value all the way to one. Or maybe I won't use this for the roughness and I'll change the roughness to a constant value of 0.3. Now, I think to make this even more prominent, we can use this as the bump values as well. So I'll press Shift A and search for a bump node and I'll take this color, plug it into the height and then take this normal and plug it into the normal of the principled PSDF. Now, the strength might be way too high, so let's start reducing using the strength until we get something that looks nice. Maybe I'll go with a value of 0.45. Now to make all of this look a lot more cinematic, I think it should be scaled up on the Z axis. So I'll just select these and press SZ 1.6. And then it's very important to select each of the objects, which is the walls and the inner loops, and then press Control A and choose Apply Scale. You can do the exact same thing for the inner materials as well. And the reason you're doing that is because right now, if you actually look at it, because we scaled it up on the Y axis, this thickness is more than this thickness because it's being scaled up. When we press Ctrl A and apply the scale, the thicknesses will instantly become the same and I think that just looks a lot better. Now that we have that set, we can actually animate the camera. So let's select the camera press Alt G to clear location, Alt R to clear rotation. To see the camera, you can just switch on overlays if you've switched it off. And then we'll press R X 90 to rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees. Then we'll press zero on our numpad to go into the camera view. And in case you don't have a numpad, 
you can always choose view cameras and choose active camera from here. Then we'll change the focal length on the camera from 50 millimeters to something like 18 millimeters to make it much more wide angle. Then we'll go to our viewport display, go all the way down to passport out and increase that all the way to one so that nothing outside our camera view distracts us. Then we'll go ahead and take this camera and press GZ to bring it down so that it looks like you're much closer to the ground because you physically are closer to the ground. Now, I think a placement that works perfect for this scene is such that this inner loop that we created will go out of the camera scene at the exact same time. So the sides as well as the bottom should leave the camera at the same time. So a camera placement of something like this is perfect because when we take the camera and press GY to move it on the Y axis, as we move front, it's going to leave on the sides as well as the floor at the exact same time. And I think that looks pretty good. So once you're happy with the position, change your end frame to 150 so that it becomes a five second long loop and you want the frame rate to be 30 frames per second for it to be a five second long loop at 150 frames. So we'll go to our output properties, change the frame rate to 30 frames per second, output for you can choose whatever you want double slash will store the file wherever you've saved your blend file so make sure you save it change the file format to ffmpeg video the encoding i'm going to change the container to mpeg4 and the output quality to perceptually lossless then i'll press the back arrow to go to frame zero and in case any keyframes are present tap a and x to delete the keyframes now on frame zero press i location and now remember our default cube was two meters long and then we extruded it and moved it by two meters as well this length was two meters and then we moved it by two meters again so one unit is essentially four meters so in our camera view we're gonna have to select the camera and go to the last frame and press g y followed by that length which was four units and then hit enter followed by i followed by location so that way we will move through exactly one loop and the frame 150 and zero will look exactly the same except for that absolute edge over here where a few extras will appear or disappear but we'll take care of that as well in a while for the time being if you actually play the animation by pressing the spacebar or pressing the play animation button you'll see it starts off slow speeds up and then slows down again right here we don't want that we want it to move at a constant speed so we'll come down here and press t linear so that way you should get a smooth loop even through the transitions from the last frame to the first frame and if you're happy with the way that looks we can start messing around with this section over here such that we don't get the last few to appear and disappear when the loop resets for that we have to use some volumetrics so we're going to go ahead and go back to a viewport shading of solid and then press shift a and add in another cube now this cube will just scale it up until it fits in one full block and then we'll scale it on the y-axis by maybe something like 10 so that it becomes fairly long. Now, I think 10 is also a bit too much, but it's all right. Now we can press GY and then just move it back so that at least six or seven of these units are completely visible and the rest are covered. And once you've placed it somewhere around there, control click the camera in the outliner, come back to the 3D viewport and press control P and choose set parent to object. Then press zero to go into your camera view. And now when you actually play the animation, the cube is going to follow along with the camera and it's going to essentially keep anything behind behind that area covered. So now when you zoom in and you go to frame 150 as well as frame zero, it should look the exact same and there won't be any differences. However, that's only because the cube is currently blocking away everything. We don't want it to just block away everything because that creates a clear sharp region from which things suddenly appear. That won't look good. So what we do is we add in a material to this particular cube. Let's select the cube, go back to our shader editor over here and press the new button to add in a new material. If you can't see these options, just use your scroll wheel to actually scroll through it. Now we'll go ahead and select the principled PSDF and tap X to delete it and we'll press shift A and search for a principled volume. Now this principled volume has to go into the volume socket of the material output and I like to change the color all the way to white and then play around with the density to make sure that we get the last and first frame to look the same. So let's go to frame 150, zoom in by pressing control middle mouse button and then go to frame zero. So clearly there are a few more things present on frame zero. So let's actually select these inner loops, go to the modifier prop Properties, go down to the array and increase the count. So on frame zero, we can see one right about there. So on 150, we should be able to have it till there. So let's increase the count to 19. And now it looks the exact same and there's a nice fade out into the darkness. So that means you're going to have a perfect loop. You can always adjust the size of these inner rings and stuff by pressing S 
followed by shift Y so that it doesn't scale on the Y axis. And then you can make them slightly smaller, maybe slightly larger. You can scale them on the Y axis on just the Z axis as well. And it's really up to you. Make sure that once you are done with the scaling, always press control A and choose apply scale. Then if you're happy with the way everything looks, you can go ahead and press render animation. I hope this was a very easy tutorial that beginners could follow through without having any issues. If you do have any issues or questions or comments, let me know down below and I'll definitely answer them. I'm trying to keep an equal balance of intermediate tutorials as well as beginner tutorials so that there's content present for everyone. If you enjoyed this one, definitely check out other videos on my channel because I post videos every single day. And until the next video comes out tomorrow, thank you so much for watching. Keep creating and don't forget to stay creative.